Welcome to WMNF 88.5 FM and WMNF.org. You're listening to the Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And today we're going to focus on water. So if you live in Florida and you think clean water is important, I hope you stay tuned and participate in today's discussion. We're talking about a proposed state constitutional amendment to guarantee the right to clean water. Our guests today are Captain Carl Digert, the chair of the Florida Political Action Committee called Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. We're also joined by Joseph Bonassia, the Southwest Florida chair of the group. Welcome to both of you to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Carl and Joe. Good morning, Sean. Thanks for having us. Well, thanks so much for, for joining us. So let's, uh, we'll have time definitely during this show to get into more details as we go along, but why don't we start simply with what does your proposed constitutional amendment say? Yeah, I'll read that for you right quick. The ballot summary reads, the, this amendment creates a fundamental right to clean and healthy waters. The amendment may be used to sue executive state agencies for harm or threatened harm to Florida's waters, which include aquatic ecosystems. This amendment defines terms, identifies affected constitutional provisions in Article 4 governing the executive branch, provides for civil action enforcement, allows attorneys and expert witnesses fees to, be, to prevailing plaintiffs, and provides equitable remedies, including restoration of waters. So in layman's terms, it would allow people to sue if the, if the waters of Florida are in jeopardy. That's correct. So, and they would be suing the state executive agencies and um, even the governors and the legislators. So I want to remind people that our guests are Captain Carl Diger and the chair of the Florida Political Action Committee, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. We'll also hear from Joseph Benassia, the Southwest Florida chair of that group, and we're talking about their proposed constitutional amendment. So, Doc, uh, Captain Diger, uh, first, before we go much further, maybe I should uh, just mention that NPR News headline item that we just heard. I, I assume, are you a, a fisher? Is that right? And uh, what, what do you think about the idea that we just cost, caught the largest freshwater uh, fish ever caught? Yeah, so um, I've actually given up fishing in Florida um, for multiple reasons. Um, I was, it was interesting that um, the Mekong River came up because the Mekong River is now under consideration for the granting of personified rights to that river uh, through a rights of nature initiative, which is where all this began here in the state of Florida to give ecosystems those protective rights, um, to bring them up to a constitutional level, basically the corporations have and that people have. So it was interesting that that was there. So where did that begin in Florida, the, the possible right of nature to, to exist, as, just like people have the right to uh, go about their business and have the rights, have, have certain constitutional rights? Yeah, so um, the rights of nature movement is global, national, and now uh, Florida has basically become the epicenter of that. Um, it is to give ecosystems, natural systems like rivers, forest, even a specific plant, a grain of rice, for example, that's uh, important to a, you know, uh, native tribe, uh, the rights to exist, to flourish and regenerate, um, and to be protected with a, the highest level of uh, law, which is a constitutional right. And that's now what we're, uh, we were striving to do that here in Florida. Um, we were successful in 2020 in Orange County um, through a charter review commission process um, the people of Orange County, Florida, within 90% approval, 89% approval, I like to round up, they uh, approved that initiative to give all the waters of the county uh, these legal protections and to also grant the people of that jurisdiction a civil human right to clean water. Unfortunately, that was uh, short-lived uh, here in the state of Florida. Uh, the legislature, once they've got wind of the creation of that rights of nature law, preempted every other jurisdiction in the state of Florida from doing such uh, an activity. Um, so with that success in Orange County, um, we had to pull back and think about how we were going to proceed forward because they had basically thwarted our work uh, that we had been working on for two years. 
So Legal Minds Greater Than Mine came up with this human civil right tactic. It's a brilliant legal strategy. And uh, we're now pushing forward to do that for every citizen in the state of Florida. Would the state legislature be able to preempt it if it does become part of the Florida Constitution? Uh, no, because this is a fundamental highest uh, law. Um, it supersedes uh, all other activity by the legislature. It's self-enacting um, when, the, when it uh, is passed by the voters in 2024. And uh, no, the legislature cannot uh, preempt or, or do things to uh, tear it down like so many other amendments they have. We've tried to to view all the possible loopholes that they could attack, and we've tried to close all those doors. I want to remind people that you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan on 88.5 FM on WMNF.org. And our guests today are talking about the Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters Amendment that could be on the Florida Constitution as, as soon as two years from now. And what, the guest we've heard so far is Captain Carl Digert, the chair of the Florida Political Action Committee, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. We also have on the line Joseph Bonassia, the Southwest Florida chair of that group. So what does it take to get to get your proposed amendment onto the ballot? What what is still needed? So I'd just like to clarify what this petition is. This this petition is most petitions um, are basically opinion polls that are taken forward to the legislature to ask them to to act as the people want them to do. Here we are recapturing our right to self-governance. We're exercising our right to create the law that we want for our communities. Um, so with 900,000 signatures, um, it's a, a gargantuan uh, effort. Um, the people of Florida will decide what's best for themselves. And <clears throat> with their signature, uh, they also empower themselves to enforce the law uh, with that right to sue the executive agencies. Um, but we need 900,000 signatures. And uh, it's going to take a monumental task and effort and across the state. We need as uh, much onboarding and support as we can possibly garner. And the date that you're hoping to get it on the ballot is the 2024. Would that be the general election? And why that year as opposed to, say, 2022 or 2026? So the requirements um, for a state amendment give you 24 months to collect those 900 signatures. They make it as difficult as possible. Uh, no electronic signature collection is allowed. It has to be a wet signature. Um, we, when we launched on Earth Day this year, we have basically had 22 months to do it. So our first goal is to collect 250,000 signatures. At that point, our amendment goes before the Florida Supreme Court for review. Um, the court does not review the language for merit. Um, they only review it basically for formatting and the fact uh, that it meets this single subject rule. Um, we've had this reviewed by multiple constitutional law attorneys to make sure that that happens and it can pass through that process. Now, of course, the court oftentimes in Florida does lean towards the, the desires of the legislature. So we have to get past that hurdle, but uh, we've done everything we can to close that door and make sure it goes forward. The Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters is the name of the PAC and the chair here for the Florida Political Action Committee Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters is Captain Carl Digert, and this is WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. Their website is floridarighttocleanwater.org, and then there's a link to that on our website, wmnf.org. And Captain Digert, on the, on a, in an op-ed that you wrote this sentence, more than 9,000 miles of our waterways and 80% of our springs are now classified uh, as impaired. So what does that mean that those waterways are impaired? They're polluted. Impaired is a euphemism that the state likes to use to dumb down what is actually happening. You know, we have the rivers, we have the springs, we have phosphate mining, we have big agriculture accounting for 80% of the nutrients entering Lake Okeechobee, we have chemicals spraying by FWC, we have wetlands destruction. We've lost one third of all Florida wetlands over the last 140 years or so. Um, 
we have toll roads that are going to be tearing up wetlands and built over our aquifers, uh, impacting our waters. Um, so uh, it's important that we get this done. And a lot of those things that you mentioned are things that I hope that we talk more in depth about during this show. And I'd also like to encourage people to call in and ask their own questions or email or text in. So if you'd like to call, the number is 813-239-9663. You can email at dj at wmnf.org, or if you'd like to text 813-433-0885. And so far, we've been speaking with Captain Carl Diger, the chair of the Florida PAC, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. But we're also joined by Joseph Bonassia, the Southwest Florida chair of the group. So Joe, let me ask you, uh, now would be a good time to bring you in. What can you say about specifically about the waters in Southwest Florida and why they need protecting? Well, I moved down to uh, Cape Coral in Lee County back in 2016. Um, I had grown up on Long Island, New York. Obviously, we have hundreds of miles of uh, beaches and shoreline there. I had never heard of blue-green algae or red tides. I started hearing a lot about them in 2016. 2018, 2019, you couldn't escape it uh, because we were hit with a double whammy, historic size algal blooms, both blue-green algae and red tide. People here were getting sick. Uh, there was a very popular uh, documentary um, circulating throughout the county, it's called Toxic Puzzle, uh, and it documents the growing um, scientific connection between blue-green algae blooms and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and ALS. The red tide also caused tens of thousands of tons of dead sea life to wash up on our shores. So our health was at risk, but also uh, our local economy down here took a, a wicked hit. A recent study showed that we lost $184 million, uh, direct tourist dollars, and indirectly over $300 million. So our quality of life down here, our health, uh, the wildlife, our economy is very much dependent upon clean water. Most of our problems don't originate where we live. I mean, some of them do. <clears throat> most, of us most of it originates north of us in Lake Okeechobee. Lake Okeechobee is very polluted. There are 50,000 tons of legacy phosphorus sitting in the bottom of Lake Okeechobee feeding algal blooms. So um, when the lake level gets too high, Army Corps of Engineers releases water down the Caloosahatchee and on the East Coast down the St. Lucie, and then we get blue-green algae blooms. The state, of course, is spending a lot of money on a, a reservoir system to clean up the polluted water after we've created the pollution. There is not very much focus on stopping pollution at the source. And our amendment can help uh, bring that about. It could compel the state to focus on that and do what needs to be done because Cleaning water up after the fact is not the solution. So the, you mentioned the 50,000 uh, tons of pollution already in Lake Okeechobee. How did it get there? How did all that pollution get there? And I imagine it's still coming in. Um, where's that coming from? Okay. So 70% of our uh, problems originate through a nutrient runoff on lands, uh, north of Lake Okeechobee, still some south where the sugarcane fields are, but uh, they've cleaned up their act um, over the last few years under so much you know, public outcry. But a lot of it is coming from north of the lake and it runs into those uh, waterways and the waterways drain into Lake Okeechobee. And then we end up suffering down here. Part of the problem is that um, there is insufficient monitoring at times of our waterways. In Lake Okeechobee, uh, I think it was T.C. Palm that did a study of the 32 water basins around the lake and uh, the findings were, were not good. 
at all. Um, in some cases, like I said, not enough monitoring. Well, uh, our law could compel the state to do sufficient amount of monitoring. Does the DEP not have, doesn't have enough staff to do the monitoring? Well, a court could compel the state to beef up its DEP staff so we do have enough monitoring. Best management practices on those lands north of Lake O, they are voluntary. If the court deems they must be mandatory, it can order the state to do that. This is a concrete illustration of how our amendment would come into play here. That's the voice of Joe Bonassia, the Southwest Florida chair of the group Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. You're listening to WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. I'm Sean Canan, and this is Tuesday Cafe. And you can join the conversation by emailing dj at wmnf.org, or you can text 813-433-0885. We'll also take calls 813-239-9663. So uh, I'm going to unpack a word that you used. You said nutrients, nutrient runoff. And uh, when I hear that, you know, um, I happen to know that what you're talking about is you're talking about things like nitrogen and phosphorus or phosphate. Uh, so get in the waterways, but how does it get there in the first place? Where does all this nitrogen and phosphorus, all these nutrients, where do they come from? What are the sources? Well, um, to a large degree, the sources are fertilizer that is being applied to land. Um, in some cases, it's um, biosolids that are being laid um, by the state. You know, this is from sewage. Our uh, water treatment plants produce uh, a lot of these biosolids. What do you do with it? So, I mean, it can serve uh, a purpose as a fertilizer, but the state ends up applying uh, egregious amounts of it. And that too runs off into our waters. So, like I said, uh, I think I said earlier, about 70% of the nutrient runoff is coming from agricultural lands. You were speaking about the Florida right to clean and healthy waters. Joseph Benassia is the Southwest Florida chair of that group, the Political Action Committee, Florida right to clean and healthy waters. And they're proposing a constitutional amendment that will be uh, could be on the ballot in 2024. Let me read it. Uh, oh, you were about to say something, Joe? Yeah, I would just like to bring uh, a particular point to everyone's attention because uh, we hear often that we have to elect the right people and in uh, our regional uh, paper of record down here, they would have led it to the editor and the gentleman was praising Governor DeSantis for some of his efforts on behalf of water quality. What he didn't say was the bigger picture. You might not always have an environmentally conscious governor or legislature. The quality of our water cannot be dependent upon who happens to be in office. We need something that is more secure, more stable, and amending our state constitution with a fundamental right provides us with that long-term security. It cannot be dependent upon who happens to be in office. You wouldn't want that with your right to free speech or right to assembly or, or right to free pep, press. Sometimes you have the rights and sometimes you don't. That's why we have them enshrined in the constitution. That's what we aim to do here. That was the voice of Joe Bonassia, the Southwest Florida chair of the PAC, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. You're listening to WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. David writes in, uh, he says, would the amendment address the problem of leaky old septic tanks? I'm very concerned about old septic tanks in large areas like Spring Hill, that's up north of the Tampa Bay area, and Port Charlotte, which is uh, down where, closer to where you are. That's some uh, gross stuff, I tell you, says David. So what? How, how much do leaky old septic tanks contribute to the problem and would this amendment potentially help that? Yeah, the, um, so septic tanks overall across the state contribute about 15% of those nutrients, Joe, and we were talking about. So um, they are a source of the problem, but septic systems, if properly designed and elevated and planted with, uh, uh, sequestering plants on top of the, of the rain field can be very effective. Um, um, septic systems in our coastal areas where now sea level rise is becoming an issue um, is particularly a problem in Southwest Florida. Um, 
the septic systems basically become ineffective. As the table, water table rises, um, there's no time for the plants to sequester the nutrients out of the effluent from your uh, flushing of your toilet. So it basically just flows away with the runoff. Um, how the amendment would affect uh, that possibility is so if the state is allowing harm to the water by not sewering your neighborhood um, or your local municipality has been seeking the help of the state for funding to uh, maybe a grant system to homeowners to uh, update their septic systems and build better and aerobic and higher systems. Um, yes, then you could um, challenge a state executive agency to do their jobs. And that's basically what this whole amendment does. It forces the state agencies to do the jobs we put them there for. Um, so yes, septic systems could, the problems with septic certainly could be challenged uh, through, the, through the use of this amendment. That's the voice of Captain Carl Diger, the chair of the Florida Political Action Committee, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. And we also have on the Zoom with us today, Joe Bonacia, the Southwest Florida chair of that group. We're talking about a potential constitutional amendment to Florida's constitution that would protect the rights to, to clean water, clean and healthy waters in the state of Florida. And what do you think? 813-239-9663, dj at wmnf.org, or you could text us at 813-433-0885. It's 1028 in the morning, and you're listening to 88.5 FM WMNF Tampa, and this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. Uh, so, Captain Diger, you mentioned in an op-ed that you sent me that uh, you said your own two water-based businesses have suffered the impacts of our polluted waters you said, my life dreams forever tarnished and lost. So what, what were those businesses and how did they suffer the impacts of Florida's polluted waters? Yeah, so I've been coming to Florida since I was in diapers and um, um, being on the water is all I've ever wanted to do. Um, my life dream was to own a little mom and pop motel, B&B kind of a place where I could entertain people from around the world. Um, that's how I thought I would spend my retirement. <laughs> Um, I've had my boat captain's license for over 15 years, giving tours. Um, I relocated after 27 years of being in the Florida Keys to Matt Lachey, Florida. Um, I like to call it a little slice of paradise. But unfortunately, in 2016, with the cyanobacteria blooms, I stood on the back, uh, my backyard, and I said aloud, if that comes here, I'm going to have to go. Well... Didn't take long for it to get there. The Matt Lachey Pass is now covered with um, a different form of cyanobacteria called Lingbaya. It creates a heavy carpet across the seagrass beds, smothering them. As this stuff decays, it floats to the surface and basically looks like raw sewage, like a blanket of raw sewage on top of the waters. The wind pushes this into the canals in my backyard. My guests on the motel are dropping baited hooks, trying to catch fish in water that has zero dissolved oxygen levels, where I've seen fish come to the top and spiral to death at the bottom. I've got manatees tied to the municipal dock that my tour boat has to go past almost every day. My guests see dead manatees tied to a dock. Um, I just couldn't ethically do it anymore. So, where I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life it turned out not to be so. So I lost those two businesses. And what part of the state is that in? So Mount Lachey is a little island. It's um, unincorporated Lee County, just off of Cape Coral. It sits inside the uh, Pine Island, which is the 18th largest island. That island has its own issues. Um, it's primarily ag agrarian. Lots of nurseries, palm trees, fruit tr fruit nurseries, groves. So there's a lot of fertilizer there. It's also low lying. Um, septic issues are certainly a problem there, contributing factor. Um, then we have um, the issues of Cape Coral um, dumping their effluents from their canal system because they removed a boat barrier in 2008. So it's kind of a perfect storm place. We have just south of where my dock was, my little motel, just 
about four miles to the south is the uh, the, the uh, where the Clusahatchee River pours into San Carlos Bay. That was just a few miles south. So of course, with tidal change, the nutrients made it to my backyard. And then we have the Cape Coral effluent, uh, 400 square miles of surface waters flushing into that same uh, system. Um, Mount Lachey Pass is uh, an aquatic preserve. It was supposed to have a higher level of protection, just like all outstanding Florida's waters are supposed to have a higher level of protection. But as we noted, the majority of these uh, protected waters are now impaired. And That's the we, voice. Go ahead, Carl. No, and we, we, you know, we need enforcement by the people. The legislative and agency decision makers have failed us. We just need to look at our back door to find out that our waters are dirtier today than they were 50 years ago. We've got to follow a new path. And moving enforcement into the hands of the people of Florida through this amendment is that path. We need to make this happen. Our guest is Carl Digert, the chair of the Florida PAC, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. And we also have Joseph Bonassi of the Southwest Florida chair of that group on Tuesday Cafe, WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. And so uh, Captain Digert, the, the um, blue-green algae, I guess the cyanobacteria algae that you were talking about, that was essentially because of the pollution that we were mentioning earlier in Lake Okeechobee getting released to the coast through those two rivers that, that were mentioned earlier. Uh, how about red tide? Has red tide affected your uh, where you live down there in Lee County? Yeah, so what happens is the cyanobacteria is a freshwater system problem. So as it's released from the Clusahatchee River and flows down to the marine system, those bacterial cells um, lice or break open and they release the sequestered phosphorus and nitrogen back into the water column. Um, and as that flows into the marine system, it feeds the red tides. 2018, we had um, early rains um, causing uh, both the excessive runoff. And then we had the Clusahatchee uh, releases of the cyanobacteria uh, for a perfect storm. Um, my boat tour system, you know, my boat tour business went to zero. I mean, uh, all of Southwest Florida became a ghost town, essentially. Fort Myers Beach was vacant. Sanibel was vacant. Um, millions of dollars a day were being lost. Um, uh, fortunately, I have other revenue streams to uh, float my boat, <laughs> right? But... Um, no, so many small business orders were impacted. I, I can, and people are leaving, you know, I'm not the only guy closing the door, shuttering the doors on businesses. You know, we have Jensen's Marine on Sanibel, decades owned, family owned business, they sold out. Uh, South Sea Condominium Complex accounts for 10% of all Florida's bed tax. They recently sold. Um, do you think these other businesses didn't see the writing on the wall as well? Um, a local gal in Mount Lachey, she just closed her kayak business. Um, she's personally suffered health risks. Uh, she was diagnosed with toxic algae poisoning by Lee County Health System. So people are suffering health effects and the economic meltdown based on bad water is coming. And the sooner that uh, the Chambers of Commerce and the big ag folks um, Everything Florida is based on clean water. And as it becomes more polluted, um, everything from tax revenue to bed tax to public services is gonna be affected. Our guest is Captain Carl Diger, the chair of the Florida PAC, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. We're also jo joined by Joseph Manassia, the Southwest Florida chair of the group. Since we were talking about red tide, we have a few people on the line right now, but let's talk, let's take this question from a caller about red tide. So John in Largo, what would you like to ask? And turn down your- Yeah, uh, uh, your... well, I wanna ask, is it uh, more that uh, consumers are to blame or is it more that phosphate mining is to blame? Or uh, do you think that uh, phosphate mining is being ignored? and and the other way that uh, the lesser known way, I think that phosphate mining companies like Mosaic get rid of their industrial waste is by water fluoridation, where you can see on the annual water quality analyses that they, uh, under a source of uh, contamination for fluoride, it says uh, 
fertilizer factories and uh, here in Pinellas County, it says that anyway. And, uh, you know, when it, isn't phosphate mining an obsolete uh, way to grow food? Uh, it's uh, known as forced growth, where they just use the three minerals, phosph uh, potassium, nitrogen, phosphorus. And that's what most plants need to grow, but they don't do very well. So they're... All right. Thanks for that call, Chris. And so what would you say? We haven't talked yet about phosphate, um, but but Chris brings up a great point there about the 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 phosphate industry in general and how it contributes first of all to uh the the fo the phos um what am i trying to say the fertilizer industry which we've already mentioned but also the direct impacts of phosphate mining in florida on the quality of water in florida is there it, would either of you like to take that i'll take the I'd, I'd like to take uh, uh, joe would like to uh, know joe's very uh, up on um alternative farming practices so why don't you take that, Joe? I'll take that part of it, yes. Um, there are other means, other ways, sustainable ways to grow food, as the gentleman noted, ways that are much healthier, both for our land and our water. And uh, down here, people commonly say, if you want to clean up the water, you got to clean up the land. So there's regenerative farming, uh, other forms of organic farming, uh, forced uh, feeding of the soil with these um, with these fertilizers is is an obsolete way to produce food, and we cannot really, we cannot tolerate unsustainable means of growing food. This is uh, a potent problem, and Big Ag is is not going to like our amendments. But those farmers who are farming uh, sustainably are going to love it because this is going to be a boon to them. And the people of Florida must see that we've got to change the way we grow food down here and, and, and elsewhere too. Regenerative farming, other sustainable forms of farming are the way we have to go. I was on a, um, a meeting last night and I was told about citrus farmers who are looking to change the way they farm to more regenerative, more sustainable ways of farming. Because the way they're farming right now is not working and fertilizer is very, very expensive as well. So it's expensive for them, and it ends up being expensive for us because we have to pay to clean up a lot of the consequences. Yeah, I, I'd like to say that our amendment is not anti-farmer. It's pro-farming good practices. You know, we're all about cost sharing. We're all about helping the farmer, you know, um, through uh, cost sharing and being paid for direct environmental services to better their practices. We support all those things. Um, of course, that requires a lot of funding. I was told to bring an acre of land up to the best standards. It's $1,500 an acre from an organic farmer. So we can see where this impacts to the current, you know, citrus and uh, the Everglades agricultural area. We see where this could have the impacts on their on their businesses and their lives. Um, but what we can't afford is the cost of the pollution and the constant cost of remediation trying to clean it up. We need to be proactive and we need to address the, the nutrients at the sources. And phosphate is that is certainly one of the major forces. And the state executive agencies issue water consumption permits to mosaic phosphate. They use 17 trillion gallons of water a year. It's probably even higher than that. That's an old number. To dilute their toxic waste to an EPA standard for dumping into our rivers that has created the Mayaka River, the Peace River, Charlotte Harbor basically has destroyed the grass, you know, the grass beds. Um, they constantly have industrial accidents dumping. We have Piney Point dumping millions of gallons. 2016, we saw 260 million gallons flush into a 900 foot sinkhole. Um, it's an atrocious, ab abominable uh, in the industry. Um, but every politician, regardless of party, is silent on mosaic. They carry such powerful weight all the way to DC. Their tendrils run through everything Florida. They finance 4 H clubs, food banks, churches. They underwrite classrooms, uh, you know, university research. 
Uh, they are so powerful in the state of Florida. It's just uh, unimaginable. So what I'm hearing you, the two of you say is that there's kind of a twofold impact of phosphate mining. First of all, when you when you disrupt the natural environment, when you break open the, the land and, and uh, there's going to be the use of water there from the aquifer, but there's also runoff from the phosphate mines. But then the final product gets put on the land again, and that contributes to the problems in Lake Okeechobee and elsewhere. So, um, so thank you for, for answering that question. Thank you, Chris, for that question. Um, and my, the next thing I should ask is, I want well, first I should remind people that you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and our guests are Carl Diger, the chair of the Florida PAC, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. And we're also joined by Joseph Bonassi, the Southwest Florida chair of that group. They're trying to get a constitutional amendment on the Florida ballot in 2024. And that will to, to protect the Florida's right to clean and healthy water. So can one of you tell uh, our listeners, how do they get to sign that amendment? Because we have someone texting in from the 813 area code who asks, how can we sign the petition? Oh, so this is uh, very easy. All you have to do is go onto your computer, go to Florida, right to clean water.org. And you can click on uh, sign the petition, and within five minutes, you can have that printed out, signed, dated, and mailed. You cannot do this electronically. The state will not permit an electronic signature, so it has to be printed out. There are some fields that you must complete all your information. If you don't know your voter registration number, then you provide your date of birth. It's very straightforward. And there is an address on the petition itself. It is um, an address in Fort Myers. From there, we uh, process the petition. And so that's Florida right to clean water.org. If you d weren't able to write that down in time, our website, WMNF.org, has links to more information about this, uh, about this drive that they're doing. And that's WMNF.org. Let me read this question that came in from Jeff. It says, it seems obvious that clean water is important. What argument is being presented against it? Is there a way for wealthier people to secure clean water for themselves and say, screw you to the general population? So those are questions from Jeff, if either of you would like to take a stab at that. I'll answer at least part of that because I'm sort of interested in what the arguments are going to be. We did see some of this in Orange County in 2019, 2020, as Carl noted. Uh, at one point, the citizens up there were being told you cannot have affordable housing and clean water. Um, people did not like to hear that. What do you mean? We have to choose between affordable housing and clean water? Certainly, it's government's responsibility to make sure and provide both of those things. So certainly, it would increase the costs for polluters. If if you're, a, let's say, if you're um, a, a company that likes to put fertilizer on on their uh, on your crops, it might be in the short term, at least, it might be more expensive for you to either clean up the water before it leaves your property or to switch to a different system. In the short term, it might be more expensive. So that could be one argument. Yes, they're going to see it as uh, hitting their, their bottom line. But there's we, we have to, again, see the bigger picture over here. If they're using fertilizers and it ends up costing us money to clean up the algal blooms, well, that really is a cost of their production that doesn't end up uh, evident in the price of their product. So I'd like to go back to Chris's uh, question a couple of moments ago about consumers and what they can do and are they contributing. There's nobody who is listening to this uh, show right now who would take a couple of bags of fertilizer, walk over to uh, one of our waterways and dump that fertilizer in. But if you are going to Publix and you are buying your standard produce or whatever that has been grown with fertilizer, you're basically paying those farmers to do that for you, tablespoon by tablespoon. Meanwhile, the sustainable farmer who has to work his butt off to compete with the conventional farmer um, too often does not, who, who is farming sustainably, does not get the business 
that he should. So I would argue for everybody listening, spend the extra few pennies at Publix, buy the sustainable product, and purchase by purchase, you will help to restore the quality of our waters, at least for those products that are grown in Florida. That's the voice of Joe Bonassia, the Southwest Florida chair of the PAC. Florida right to clean and healthy waters. They're trying to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot in 2024 to protect Florida waters. We, our other guest is Carl Diger, the chair of that Florida PAC, Florida right to clean and healthy waters. You can find them at floridarighttocleanwater.org. You're listening to WMNF Tampa, 88.5 FM. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. It's 1046 in the morning. And we're going to continue to talk about water in Florida because it's so important. And one thing we haven't really talked about yet is uh, so springs and keeping the the amount of water flowing f into a spring, the, the flow in th through a spring that's called minimum flows and levels. And also there's been a, a lot of controversy in the last few years about bottled water being taken from springs and sold to, across the globe instead of just keeping it in the in Florida's ecosystem, even though Florida's running low on fresh water. So would either of you like it to take a stab at the idea of springs and protecting the freshwater flow in, of springs and how bottled water is affecting that? I'll start off on that one. The, um, so uh, I've had the pleasure of reading, uh, recently meeting the former mayor of Benel in Florida. It's the home of the Rainbow River and the Rainbow Springs, Walter Green. And Walter said to me, Carl, how many straws can we put in Florida's cup? And it paints a perfect picture. How many straws can we put in Florida's cup? We are extracting too much water, whether it's for industrial use at Mosaic or it's bottling at Nestle or every bedroom that gets built needs a toilet. We are extracting too much water. There are maps designed by the state of Florida that will show you where freshwater resources are will be at great risk in just a few years. We have Polk County, Florida, in the middle of the state, home to Mosaic, where they are now installing desalinization plants in the middle of the Florida because water extraction allows saltwater intrusion from below into the aquifer to make that water undrinkable. You have nutrients flowing in for, because as you reduce the water pressure within the aquifer, water, all those nutrients on the land and on the groundwater seep downward into that aquifer. So they're, since they're installing desalinization plants in the middle of the state, they're also treating their wastewater, the stuff you flush down the toilet, they're treating it and putting it back into the drinking water system. Folks, if you think that's okay, <laughs> Um, I just, I, I just don't, I, I don't know why anybody would not get behind this petition because um, all our waters are at risk and we need to take the action because your legislature is not doing it for you. We need to take this over and uh, this amendment is your tool, your tool to protect your communities. So we need you to sign this petition. You know, one, that's one of the points that, that people who oppose constitutional amendments often say. They'll say that, you know, something like protecting fleet clean water, that should be done in the legislature. That should be done through laws and, and things that the legislature can do. Yet you're trying to put this in the Florida Constitution. And this is related to a, an email question that we got from Bubba. And Bubba says, I'm irritated by the greedy fools in the Florida legislature for making it harder for a citizen's initiative to pass. Could your guests address this issue? So a couple of things to address, if you don't mind. Um, the, the idea of it being a constitutional amendment versus relying on the legislature to actually put something in law. And also the idea that the legislature is making it more difficult for, for constitutional amendments like this to pass. Yeah. Sean, I'd like to deal with the first of those two issues. I would recommend a book, certainly for all South Floridians. It's called A Toxic Inconvenience. It's written by Nicholas Penniman. The man has stellar credentials. And he talks about um, red tides and blue-green algal blooms in Florida over the past 50 years. You read that book and you walk away and you understand very clearly that for these last five decades, Florida has never shown the political will to stand up to special interests 
in order to protect our waterways. It is downright foolish to think that all of a sudden the legislature is going to turn around and start doing what they should be doing. We have, because they are so influenced by special interests, the checks and balances in our government down here are not nearly as strong as they need to be. No, I do not trust the legislature to do the right thing. And that's why we need a constitutional and a fundamental right here that is above their heads and out of their reach. It's not something we turn to every day, every week, but every once in a while, when we need a stopgap measure in order to prevent some terrible harm, then that's when we go to this law and um, it protects both us and our waterways. You, you have to be foolish to believe that the legislature is going to all of a sudden turn around after 50 years of not protecting our waters. So I just like to little, interject a little personal. I, what Joe says, that's what I want, what Joe says. So I was, um, I was fed up. I had gone to the meetings. I had gotten up and spoken my three minutes over and over and over again, just to hear them say, thank you for coming today, next. And almost defeated, I decided I was basically just gonna go about my life. And then I was asked to run for House of Representatives in Lee County. Um, and I said, yes, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna go to Tallahassee and make a change, right? And it was about two weeks after I said yes that I discovered the rights of nature movement and this recapture of our civil right to create these laws by petition, where we don't need the permission of a legislator, we don't need their approval, their permission, their acceptance. We, the people, make this happen. We write the, the language we want it to happen. We vote to put it on the ballot, and then we vote to put it in place. Folks, if you're listening, you got the power to make this happen. And just like Joe said, Electing the right guy is good, but when that guy gets to Tallahassee, he has to convince 140 other guys to think like him. And that just doesn't happen. It certainly doesn't happen in enough time. We are at a critical point of no return on water quality in the state of Florida, even the planet. This needs to happen as quickly as possible. And you, you have the ability to make this happen in 2024 with your signature. Sean, I, I think this also leads into the second part of your question, which is, uh, regarding why the state has been making um, citizens' initiatives more and more difficult. Yes. Well, doesn't this highlight whose interests they're really protecting over here? Why would they want to undermine what the citizens are looking uh, to promote? Obviously, they're much more concerned with protecting the uh, those special interests than they are the democratic rights of Floridians. Our guests are Joe Bonassia, the Southwest Florida Chair of the Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters PAC. And we also have Carl Deigert, who is the Chair of the Florida PAC, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. They're working on a constitutional amendment that may be on the ballot in 2024 to protect Florida waters. And this is 88.5 FM WMNF Tampa. I'm Sean Canan. Let's go back to the phones and hear from Jim in Bradenton. Hi, Jim, what would you like to say? Yeah, hello. Uh, my question is, how does the um, population of Florida factor into uh, all these problems? And I heard uh, on the news not long ago, a couple of weeks ago, there's a thousand people a week moving into Florida. Uh, the state can only handle so much the way, you know, the way I see it. I'm going to hang up and listen to your answer. Thanks, Jim. Too many straws. Think? Too many straws. You know, Imagine a thousand people a week, that's 330,000 people, 350,000. That's the equivalent of the population of the city of Orlando every year. It's expected to continue for the next 10 or 15 years. Where are you gonna put them? Where are you gonna put their wastewater? Where are you gonna, uh, where are you gonna find the freshwater resources to, to, to fill their sinks? Where's that happening? Um, and, and also based on that, you know, we, the issuance of permits is basically just a system of stage degradation. You know, permits make an illegal activity legal and they just keep issuing them for building at the coastlines. 
when we need to be talking about managed retreat today, where are you going to move all this infrastructure and buried pipes and septic tanks? Where, I mean, as sea level rises, it's going to recapture all this stuff. And where are you going to pull back to? How are they going to manage that? And nobody's even mentioning this now. And every project going forward, whether it's an Everglades restoration project or an infrastructure project, needs to account not for what's happening today, but what's coming 40 or 50 years down the road. Because oftentimes these projects are just wasting money in advance of, of, of failure. They need to start thinking about where they're spending their money and how to best spend that money. Let's take another call, if we can. Mike in Seminole. Hi, Mike. Yeah, what I wanted to speak about is my parent-in-laws had bought some property in Pasco back in the late 60s, early 70s. And the place was just filled with lakes all over the place. In fact, their property probably had two acres of lake on it. It's just dry pasture land now, and there has not been any standing water or anything on that. And it's just because of the big straws from Pinellas and Hillsboro and everything. They've drained Pasco County of pretty much what was natural, you know, phenomenon there as far as lakes and everything were there or posed were there. And I'm sure that had a lot, you know, of effect on the wildlife and everything. And I do a lot of hunting up in Bushnell and around. And there are actually people looking up at the uh, green swamp and areas like that because of the amount of water that is there. And if we keep going at the rate we're going, there won't be a green swamp anymore. You know, they'll dry that out and there goes even more habitat for wildlife plus you got to have water to sustain people. Mike, thanks for those comments. Let's hear what our guests have to say about that. Again, it gets back to too many straws. It's um, it's all about making the last dollar to the exploitation of our resources and our lands and our waters. And big special interest, make sure it happens every day. They got people sitting in Tallahassee to make sure that the legislature creates the rules they want to be governed by and they want to play by. We basically got into a system where every legislative decision is based on some regulatory rule that some corporation made previously. It's a fixed and rigged system and we need to break that system. Uh, we need to follow a new paradigm of protections and rights protections, especially rights for nature, which would, you know, all rights movements, whether it was the suffragettes or the freeing of slaves take decades, women's rights, you know, all these things are decades, even a century old, and have they actually been achieved, they're still fighting for it. So we know uh, this right to clean water, we hope to achieve that in two years. But, you know, ultimately, we would see a whole cultural shift towards protecting the ecosystems with these protective rights, but we know that's a long road. Um, and we hope folks will pick up the torch behind us. Um, but, uh, final, we need to do that. final words, Joe. Yes, uh, especially the gentleman's comments highlight just how critically important water is to Floridians. We're not Florida if we don't have healthy waters. The importance of waters merits the, the protection that a fundamental right can provide. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on Double the MNF's Tuesday Cafe, Carl and Joe. Thank you, Sean. Pleasure being here. They're with Florida Right to Clean Water.org. Captain Carl Diger is the chair of the Florida PAC, Florida Right to Clean and Healthy Waters. Joe Bonassia is the Southwest Florida chair of that group. You can find out more at Florida Right to Clean Water.org. That link is also on our website, WMNF.org. I want to thank Greg for answering phones, and you've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Kanan. The show is every Tuesday morning at 10. Next Tuesday, I'll be interviewing the author of a book called Climate Nomics. Thank you to everyone who contributed during our recent summer fun drive. 
In this time slot tomorrow, Shelly will host Midpoint. Next up, we have a special presentation of background briefing in place of wave makers. That's coming up after NPR headlines. This is WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, and Lakeland. Thanks so much for listening to WMNF.org and the WMNF app.